on behalf of department of biotechnology and microbiology kc college hsnc university consider it as my great honor to welcome one and all present here as you all know we have assembled for the popular science lecture organized by indian women scientist association bashi navi mumbai in association with the departments of biotechnology and microbiology kc college church kit the event is supported by the board of research in nuclear sciences department of atomic energy and our topic is cut brain axis and the speaker for the day is dr dheeraj dotre from nccs pune for all the participants who have assembled here for across the country i would like to introduce our college to you kc college was established in the year 1954 by hyderabad sin national collegiate board with the motto of salvation through knowledge over the years kc has established itself as one of the leading colleges in mumbai kc was awarded with best college award 2013-14 reaccredited a grade by nac in its third cycle in the year 2020 we created history when kc college hr college and bombay teachers training college became the cluster university hsnc university first in the state to be run by the charitable trust managed by hyderabad sin national collegiate board the college has received star college scheme by department of biotechnology government of india for the year 2016 to 19 and in the year 1920 five departments of sciences including the department of biotech microbiology chem life science and biostatistics has been conferred with the prestigious star college status by the department of biotechnology government of india for the years 2019 to 2022 the department of microbiology was established in the year 1977 and the department of biotechnology was established in the year 2002 both the departments offers ug program with the aim to prepare students for diverse careers ranging from research to teaching to industry department of microbiology also offers a pg program by paper the department of microbiology was awarded the best department award at national level by microbiologist society of india in the year 2020 may i now request dr sejal rathod associate professor head department of microbiology and coordinator of biotechnology to deliver the welcome note in address thank you rajika i think you can stop the screen sharing so very good evening uh, to our speaker for the day dr deeraj totre from ncs pune iwc president dr rita mukhopadhyay immediate past president dr susan yepen dear teacher colleagues and all the participants So on behalf of departments of biotechnology and microbiology, KC College, HSNC University, I welcome you all to this popular science lecture that we have organized in association with Indian Women Scientists Association under the PPT Star College status. It's our indeed privilege to host this popular science lecture titled "Cut Brain Access" by renowned scientist Dr. Deeraj Chowdhury. Sir, uh, we welcome you at the KC College platform and are eagerly waiting to hear from you. I would also like to welcome and express my gratitude to IWS President Dr. Rita Mukhopadhyay and uh, Immediate Past President Dr. Susan Yepen for giving us this opportunity to host this webinar. Dear participants who are from different parts of India, we at KC have always strived to provide. Uh, all of us with opportunities that will enhance all our knowledge knowledge of all of us this is one such session and i request each one of you to absorb as much as possible from today's session and make the most of it i once again welcome all of you all uh, thank you over to you rajita thank you ma'am it's indeed our uh, privilege over the last few years every year we have been hosting popular science lecture in association with ifsa we have with us today dr reetha mukhopadhyay president of ifsa ma'am had joined brc in the year 1994 
after her postdoctoral research from National Cancer Institute, NIH, USA. She has incepted human molecular genetics and genomics work at Molecular Biology Division, BARC, till the year of her retirement, that is November 2019, where she retired as the head of gene technology section. Thank you, ma'am. In, uh, may I now call upon ma'am to introduce to us the various objectives and activities carried out by IFSA. And good evening to everyone and thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, as rightly said, the program for um, Board of Nuclear Sciences supported popular science lectures that we have been successfully conducting only when colleges like yours, Star uh, College Status and other institutes join hands. It's my pleasure to give a very brief introduction because if all of you go to the uh, HTTPS IWSA.net, uh, you would be able to browse at your leisure about the activities of our uh, social welfare organization. So this is uh, this organization was uh, uh, constituted. It came into being registered in the 1973. You see the picture of our founder members of whom two of them are with us today, Dr. Sudha Padi and Dr. Lalit Narurkar. At their uh, ivory ages, they are supporting the organization to its fullest even till today. The mandates of the Institute are showcased on the right and rightfully, it's our onus to take the sciences to the society, uh, bring in the fervor of science scientific thinking and dissemination of knowledge as far as wide we can reach. And these are the popular science lectures through which we interact with students. We bring in faculty of the stature as you will see in the speaker today. And that is the way forward, uh, joining hands with many, many more scientists to come into this organization to work with us. Next slide. We are a all India social welfare voluntary, non-profit, secular, and non-political charitable organization. So therefore, there are two arms of such institutions in the country. We have an arm for the community welfare activity, and the other part is our direct contribution as any other scientific association in the country to the sciences. In the community welfare activities, we have uh, over 40 years, that was the very first a uh, women's working women's hostel which had come up at the area which was just developing in the 70s that is washi in navi mumbai and today we have a 70 170 bedded uh, facility during the pandemic we went low in the numbers because many women had to leave the city and go back to their hometowns and they are slowly coming back and this is a forum to uh, spread the message that if a woman visiting the city for work or for um, education do please approach us and we would be happy to engage you all with our hospitality a secure safe heaven our hostel we have just completed the computer centers 30 years and on the 26th of September. And this, as you can see, as early as in the 70s, we thought there was a need of uh, computer education. And through this, uh, we are spreading the knowledge of uh, computation, computer uh, software analysis, trainings, and many other activities up to the latest of also, as all of you know, the artificial intelligence or machine learning uh, workshops. And we usually go by the workshop manner to train the students uh, of any age uh, in the center. We do have the nursery school activity, which is at the moment um, closed because of the pandemic, but our nursery school caters to the neighborhood children and mostly they also have lived in our, uh, spend their time in our daycare center on the left, right, on the uh, bottom left. We have a green initiative on our campus and from the very beginning of the times. It's not that now we have woken up to the need of the hour, which already the humanity is falling behind. But we had begun long ago 
and we have our solar panels, solar heater. We have the green initiative of the biogas plant as a demo plant all on the campus of the Navi Mumbai headquarters. We have a beautiful learning garden living museum, which is upcoming. And there is where the educational activity is opening up for all branches of science because garden is a heaven to do all the sciences, the natural sciences. Next slide. We have a library which is state um, helped and we have a health health care center for the community. Uh, yes, you can pass this over and the students can see that we are also conducting Python classes for the students. So do contact us and being an NGO, we are very reasonably priced for our resources. This is the healthcare center I was talking about, and we do extend to the community dental and other facilities, physiotherapy, for instance, and uh, annual cancer checkups. Currently, it has opened up, and uh, the neighborhood is where we serve, and we want to collaborate and get funding to do outreach to the masses in rural sector of the country, particularly uh, concentrating on women and child health. Next one. Should be the picture, a glimpse of the hostel. Yes, next one, please. This is the daycare center when it used to thrive and be lively with all the children playing in our garden. This place is very different. It's nothing like how the other daycare centers are or the nursery schools are because we have a beautiful garden and we have a playway way of teaching. Next one. So part of the social activities were showcased to you all. And here is where our activities in science awareness programs. And this is a glimpse of how we reached out to thousands more school children through various activities. And even during the pandemic, we were able to conduct the science exhibition this year in February. Next one. Our mode of reaching to the masses. This is the garden slide. And uh, this is only to tell you that these are the courses which we have already conducted and are again waiting for uh, the pandemic to whenever it leaves us that we would go back to the garden and be uh, starting our interactive uh, visits and classes for um, college students and uh, schools and all the neighborhood uh, area people who are welcome to come and nurture and nurture the science in the garden and enjoy uh, all what we have been able to showcase from this uh, learning experience. Uh, next one, just a glimpse of how lively it is. And here is where the worth mention of the 2020 pandemic bound, homebound virtual platform opening up led all of us to get into a new education and become savvy with online virtual meetings as the one which we are currently holding. So these were our new lecture series which we introduced and one of them was the member enrichment program where each member spoke about their work and their expertise and tried to empower each other. We started the series called Science and Our Life, where we have a very popular, very eminent speakers to come and talk to the society about how it's intermingled and inter entwined, science is entwined in our lives. And we cannot uh, but exist without breathing and speaking science. Uh, member and empowerment programs, health, wellness, happiness, etc. There are, uh, everything is on the website, but still it's my, duty to be able to spread the information to the audience who are representing the national body. Our new collaborative programs opened up during the pandemic and there is an interesting program where students again can participate. That's an each one teach one program where we are training for mentorship and a mentor mentee relationship which takes forward the education from the college students to the school students and our mentors are taking care of overlooking this entire program. Next one. 
Uh, this is one which we opened up for the teacher's training course, which is uh, running at the 26th year now. And very successfully, we have uh, graduates who are uh, working to become Montessori teachers, the very primary crux of the development of a child's mind. And that's where you need holistic education. And our teachers had uh, been able to conduct the Sikshan Shetu, the course for holistic training under the new education policy. And this was in collaboration with the Vigyan Prasar. And uh, that was a two year collaboration. And we look forward for many other new ones to reach the masses through such activities. Next one. Now we come to the other programs which we introduced in 2021. And that should be interesting to my audience of students who are present here and in a large number, I see 119 participants and I'm assuming there are more than 80 students who are listening to, uh, waiting to listen to the speaker and I'm coming in the way. But I think even my, uh, in, my inputs will be helpful to you all in your uh, career developments. Uh, we at the Indian Women Scientists Association have opened up to skill development programs and to the internship programs. We already have conducted successfully two uh, virtual uh, sessions, one in February, one in June, July, and the other one with IFSA SIES College Scion is going to come up in November 2021. And what did we do? We made groups of students, five to six of them. Maybe they were spread about all over the world. Even there were students from College of uh, uh, Jai Hind, but currently sitting in Dubai because of the pandemic. But they all came up on board with our virtual mode. Our mentors, a team of at least two to three mentors, we bring in experts and the experts interact with the students directly. Then we bring in special lectures on the subjects and the uh, projects are jointly designed to benefit IWSA and the student and the college. So here you see a glimpse of uh, what we did for ecological restoration by using saplings of uh, mangroves and being the coastal area and mangrove uh, nursery from the Broadridge, we could motivate the students to grow the saplings into a maturity and then we actually took it to the coastline and planted them. So this is one glimpse but besides this we have done extensive projects from uh, molecular biology, uh, virtual snap gene, uh, python or uh, even um, fermentations and uh, many, many, many more projects all across the sciences and we are opening up for chemistry and physics also. Uh, so students need to contact us through their institutional heads and then we can form a team to go ahead and help each other. And yes, uh, the students are amazed that how great crown people can have so much of enthusiasm for sharing knowledge of science. Next one, please. How do we speak to the community besides these interactions is through our quarterly newsletter. Again, it's archived. All the volumes are archived in our webpage. Do please go to those sites to see what our activities span across. And this is a very popular uh, print media. And we are also coming up with our proceedings of each of the conferences it's to be able to communicate to the society uh, the science that needs to be nurtured and the ethics of science and in a totality uh, become a contributor to the development of sciences in the country and in the international forum. With this, I will end welcoming all students to this meeting and thanking the college to give me this brief time to talk about IWSA. And uh, with this again, thank you and welcome to IWSA website and do connect with us whenever you all feel so. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for making us aware of the different activities, training programs, which is carried out by the members and volunteers of IFSA. We are also fortunate to have with us one scientist whom Stanford University has included in the world top 2% top two percent ranking scientist in the category plant biology and botany. Ma'am is retired from BARC in the year 2011 Still, she's one very active through all her various activities of IFSA. 
She's considered as one of the pioneers in transgenic plant research and has developed transgenic plants which could take up heavy metals and degrade organic pollutants. May I now request Dr. Susan Epen, past president IFSA and the former board of trustees to introduce the speaker for the day, Dr. Dheeraj Dhotre. Thank you, Rajita, for the kind words. Dr. Dheeraj Dhotre is currently scientist D at the National Center for Cell Science, the National Center for Microbial Research, Pune. Earlier, he had worked as senior research scientist, innovative technology, Reliance Life Sciences Private Limited, Navi Mumbai. Dr. Dotre did his uh, BSc in Zoology from University of Mumbai and later did both his MSc and PhD in Bioinformatics from University of Pune. His research area include important topics such as human microbiome in health and disease, microbial genomics and metagenomics, analysis methods for genome and microbiome data, et cetera, et cetera. He has studied in detail gut, oral, and skin microbiome in both health and disease conditions, and is involved in Indian Human Microbiome Initiative, IHMI, a flagship program of Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. Besides, he has handled several projects on obesity, IBD, COPD, type 2 diabetes, mother-infant gut microbiome, and gut-brain axis. He has been awarded DBT, JRF, and SRF fellowships, and also travel award in 2014 for management and application of microbial data resource by WFCC, UNESCO, WGCM, and IMGAS. He has about 50 publications in international and national journals and has contributed three book chapters. He has wide teaching experience, not only in NCCS, but also in departments of microbiology and bioinformatics of University of Pune. He has conducted several workshops in Goa, Gauhati and other places and he was a main organizer for the International Microbiome Research Workshop. He's also a reviewer of several journals. His project funding up to the level of 34 crores was handled by him and this uh, colleague, former colleague. Uh, the program was on Indian Human Microbiome Initiative. He was also involved, uh, got funding from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, BIRAC, Department of Biotechnology, RUSA UGC, UGC and INNO, Indo Finnish Mobility Grant. Today, he will uh, speak, uh, speak to us and enlighten us on the topic gut brain axis. Dr. Dheeraj Dothre, please. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for all these kind words and introducing me. Uh, so let me share my screen. So because this is a popular science talk, I went with my gut feeling and decided that I'll remove all the technical jargon and just talk about the research which is going on in this field currently. Uh, because there are uh, graduate and undergraduate students, I thought I'll just first touch upon different concepts and then how uh, gut uh, and brain axis behave and how you have another brain in your gut. So with this, I'll start with my presentation. So I hope everybody can see this. 
So uh, the gut brain axis uh, is basically the connection between the gut and the brain. And uh, nowadays, people have started appreciating that we have another brain in our gut. Uh, it is long known in Ayurveda that uh, there is a concept of Agni. So Agni basically is uh, uh, something which converts our food in the form of energy and which is also responsible for the vital functions of, of our body. So in Ayurveda, they also consider this, uh, there are different types of Agnis in Ayurveda basically and Dehagni is one of them, which is the cause of life, complexion, strength, health, nourishment, luster, uh, Oja and Teja, which we can say that it is these are the form of energy and Prana, which is the life energy. And this was documented long back by Charaka. And uh, Ayurveda also, there are few concepts uh, called as uh, Prakriti phenotypes, right? So uh, when Ayurvedic physician, they assess a particular individual, they identify by asking them variety of questions. They first of all try and identify the type of Prakriti these individuals belong to. So we call them as phenotypes. So in Ayurveda, there are three different phenotypes. Vata, Pitta and Kapha and all these phenotypes and the energy that they get it all finally comes down or boils down to the Agni. So Agni is central to Ayurvedic concepts and it is again well known in Ayurveda that uh, Agni, when the Agni of an individual is summer, summer means when it is in the stable state, the person would be absolutely healthy and he, to, he will lead to a long healthy and happy life. But if this Agni of the person is weakened or disturbed by any means, the whole metabolism in the body would be disturbed, resulting in ill health and then eventually in disease condition. Hence, in Ayurveda, as I said, the Agni is said to be the base or mula of life. And surprisingly, the same concept also was found in uh, the Western world. So you might have heard about Hippocrates, who is uh, considered as the father of modern medicine. And in way back 320 BC, he said that all the diseases, they begin in the gut. And he also mentioned that our food should be our medicine and our medicine should be our food. Right. So both the ancient science uh, or the you know, practitioners, if we see, they believed in the concept of gut and they believe that all the diseases, all the start of all the diseases starts in the gut and the food that we eat, right? So quickly, before we move on to the concept of this gut brain axis, let us see how this gut is. So on the left hand side, here you can see the basic gut, right? So Gut, when we say, we say about GIT, which is gastrointestinal tract. So it starts from the mouth and it ends in the anus. And there are several parts like esophagus, stomach, jejunum, ileum, small intestine, large intestine, colon, rectum, and anus, right? So if we take any part of this GIT and if we dissect it, we can see that the part which is exposed to the lumen, lumen is the middle part of the gut, right? So the part which is exposed to the lumen, it has lots of protrusions. So they are called as villi, right? So all these villi, so if we see closely, they are lined by epithelial cells, okay? And there is usually a single layer of epithelial cell uh, lined in the uh, mucosa, okay? So same thing when we see on the right-hand side, so we have a lumen here and these small villi you can see and then there is this muscular part outside. So this all pink part is called as a mucosa. And above the mucosa, you can see that there are different layers. So we can also see a nerve layer here. Then there are again connective tissues. There are blood vessels and media. So the other part, this upper part is also called as a submucosa. Okay. So as I mentioned now, all this, the entire gut is lined by muscular tissues. Uh, and also lots and lots of nerve cells. So when we say these about these nerve cells in our brain, basically we have how many? 
around 100 billion neurons right but if we see this entire gut so for example if we stretch the entire gut it um, it actually counts around 40 uh, 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 meters right so it is actually the size of a tennis court and if we just unfold all the layers of our gut one by one and if we spread them around the total entire area that it covers is 40 square meters so you can imagine the size of the gut right and the neurons which are involved in the gut these neurons or the nerve cells we have around 200 million nerve cells uh, sorry 500 million nerve cells which are connected to the gi tract and if we talk about the types of neurons we have around 20 different types of neurons so if we now count the size of these neurons which are associated with the gut we as i said ki we have 500 million neurons associated with the gut so it counts to the size of a cat's brain right so you can imagine the amount of nerve cells and neurons which are present around the gastrointestinal tract now yeah, if you look so closely so now so our entire nervous system the cns and ens cns is basically the central nervous system which involves the uh, brain uh, spinal cord and different parts of the brain and when we talk about ens it actually uh, is the peripheral nervous system where it is actually um, uh, covers different nerves for example vagus nerve now this vagus nerve is directly connected to the gut and there are different neurons as we already discussed they are directly in contact with the uh, vagus nerve and there is there is a two way connection connection or communication between the gut and the brain okay so now um, let me introduce you the other concept so most of you might have heard about microbiome right so this gut it doesn't only process the food but it also is home to trillions of bacteria which resides inside the gut so we have around 100 trillion bacteria in and on our body right and if we see the distribution of these bacteria in stomach we have approximately 1000 bacteria per ml of fluid if we see the small intestine the number is around 10000 per ml of fluid but if we see the large intestine we have 10 billion bacterial cells uh, per ml of fluid so you can imagine the amount of bacteria which is present in this huge uh, ecosystem that we have uh, and again if we look closely in the stomach region we have different type of bacteria like streptococcus staphylococcus enterococcus lactobacillus and corny bacteria but the diversity changes the type of bacteria changes when we go down to the intestine uh, small intestine and large intestine so here you can see that along with these bacteria there are few others also like klebsiella enterobacter bacteroides eubacterium clostridium rubriculus and etc okay now if we see the condition in the gut if we move from proximal end to the distal end the bacterial load goes on increasing so as we see, as we can see the large intestine holds huge amount of bacteria as compared to the stomach and if we see the number of anaerobes the bacteria which can live live only in oxygen deprived condition they again increase in the colonic region as compared to the upper part of the git at same way uh, it is exactly inversely remote uh, Uh, inversely related to the oxygen uh, availability right so oxygen levels goes on decreasing uh, till the distal end of the gastrointestinal tract and you can also see the ph and the aerobic bacteria now coming to this microbiome now last 12 or 15 years people have seen huge amount of research done in this field and people have found that approximately 90% of the diseases known to the human they are some way or the other linked with the microbiome or they are linked with the gut as we have also already seen in the uh, previous slides that we, i mean uh, ancient literature also says that uh, everything starts in the gut so now we know the modern science started appreciating the previous concepts and now we know that 90% of the diseases are some way or the other linked with the gut as i said there are 10 to 
100 trillion bacteria so we have approximately for every one human cell we have one microbial cell associated with it and if we say see the size uh, so this concept of 10x times of bacteria now it is old now based on the new concept we know that at least there is one uh, bacterium associated with every human cell not every human cell but we have one to one comparison there and um, if we see the gene content so we know that humans we harbor approximately 22 to 23000 genes right but if we see the microbial contribution we have 3.3 million genes coming from this microbial world so you can imagine the amount of uh, work these microbes can do inside our body okay and if we compare to individuals by looking at their genomes the human genomes we are 99.9% similar but if we see the individual by their gut microbiome or by their entire microbiome we are 80 to 90% different than each other so you can imagine the amount of role this bacteria can play so this part i already explained so for uh, every human gene there are 10 genes contributed by these microbes so there is a huge paradigm shift now in last uh, few years because we always thought that whatever we are is because of our genetic makeup and the lifestyle or the environment that we live in but now we have another gear to the entire story uh, which is called as a microbiome and it also plays a significant role in what we are so how this microbiome is developed so if we start looking at this microbiome right from the birth so mother uh, during its gestational period so there are few papers which also say that uh, placenta also has its own microbiome obviously there are uh, contradictions about it some people say that it is just because of the contamination placenta will not have any microbes but there are again reports which say placenta also has its own microbiome but once the baby is delivered and the microbiome of the baby also depends directly on the maternal health so the diet the mother is taking if the mother is obese the gestational diabetes and other lifestyle uh, that mother is following based on that the baby's microbiome is determined and once the baby is delivered the type of microbes the baby will have have will also de determine whether it will go to um, it will uh, further in life whether it will have uh, sepsis or any c or such type of diseases now the type of birth also plays a important role because people have observed the researchers have found out that when the baby is normally born uh, it has a higher load of good bacteria but when the baby is born by c section it uh, harbors more bacteria uh, which are close to the skin of the mother so it doesn't have all the bacteria which should be there in the in the gut but it also has bacteria uh, which are very similar to the skin microbiome and later on people have also studied the cohort for many years now and they have seen that these babies later in their life uh, develop uh, different uh health conditions like asthma uh autoimmune diseases uh, diabetes uh, or obesity later in their life so the the way the baby is born is also important because of which the microbiome is determined also the way the baby is fed if the baby is breastfed or if the baby is formula fed the microbiome will change because the mother milk harbor its own microbiome it has higher abundance of two distinct type of bacteria called as bifidobacterium and lactobacillus so they are specifically fed by the mothers to the babies and these bacteria are responsible uh, to uh, generate the immune response in the babies so again there are studies uh, in germ free mice uh, so you might have heard about germ free mice so germ free mice are raised in a completely germ free environment so they do not have any bacteria in them and if we see the immunity of these germ free mice it is very weak uh, because they are not exposed to any uh, uh, exposed to any environmental conditions bacteria they do not have sufficient immunity 
but once you introduce good bacteria in them they start developing this immunity and uh, uh, it strengthens uh, their intestinal lining uh, it reduces their gut permeability so all these things people have found so these bacteria have a role to play right from the start of our life till the end and here you can also see the diversity the different type of bacteria and their abundances that means the quantity so at the early age we have less number of bacteria but as we grow and uh, we go to the adolescence we have highest abundance of bacteria and actually at the later stage in the old age the diversity again goes down so just to i mean see the importance of these organisms whether these microbes can um Uh, give their effects alone or whether do, they do uh, uh, have a influence of other factors like genetics or environment people have carried so many experiments so i am going to show you one of them so here uh, i have a example from the science paper which was published in 2013 so what they did what they wanted to know whether the obesity is only because of the lifestyle the person is following or is it because of the genetics or there are any other factors and uh, for studying this what they did uh, they uh, inoculated the fecal microbiota of these obese individuals into healthy mice okay so these are regular uh, i mean uh, raised bulb c mice and in both the type of uh, both the study groups here the recipient mice were naturally fed with normal food autoclave water and only the microbiome from the obese individuals was introduced into their gut and same way in the other group the microbiome from the lean individuals were introduced in the gut of the other subgroup of these mice and again they were given low fat and high fiber diet so the diet which is not rich in fat was given to both these mice but later on they found that these recipient mice which received the microbiota from obese twins they started uh uh gaining weight so they increased their body weight and body fat and same way the lean mice they stayed lean both of them were given the same food they were praised in the same conditions so we can clearly see that these microbes they do have a significant role to play in uh, uh in this disease same way people have also identified that these microbes also have a play uh, also have a role to play in the longevity so i have two examples here i have one example on the right hand side of turquoise killfish so what they did they checked the lifespan of this turquoise killfish so uh, so they actually fed this middle aged turquoise killfish with uh, the gut bacteria from the young peers and what they observed was 41% increase in their lifespan and similar experiment was also carried out in drosophila but in here instead of giving the fecal microbiome from the younger ones they supplemented it with specific probiotic bacteria and also the symbiotic so symbiotic means it is the combination of probiotic food or the food which uh, helps grow probiotic bacteria we call it as prebiotic okay so it is a type of food which is given and probiotics are the actual bacteria so symbiotic is the combination of both so they gave all these things to the bacteria and they actually saw uh, their impact on longevity and metabolic parameters so i have some data from the same paper so here you can see that this blue line is for the control this is one type of probiotic this is another type of probiotic this is one formulation and the symbiotic which is a combination of both and they could clearly see that in control mice the age of these drosophila was around 40 45 days but those who were fed with the probiotics and symbiotics you can easily see that there is a increase in their lifespan they also checked their fly mass so on the uh, over here in the legend you can see that uh they cap they captured their fly mass at different days different time points 0 10 20 and 30 and you can see on the right hand side 
all these probiotics and symbiotics even though the flies were fed with the same food the fly mass was reduced when these probiotics were given they also calculated the total amount of glucose and again you can see that in all these groups the amount of total glucose available was less in the drosophila fed with uh, probiotics uh, they also calculated the triglycerides and you can see the differences at all different time points so this actually shows that the uh, healthy gut microbiome definitely helps in determining not only health but also the longevity of the individual now <clears throat> coming to the uh, topic of gut brain axis so as i said so there are many bacteria who can control uh, our health as well as our disease condition but these bacteria nowadays are known that they can also directly cross talk with our brain and control our mood and behavior so you some of you might have heard about this uh, parasite called as toxoplasma gondii so when a rat is infected with this particular parasite these rat actually develops they are actually attracted towards cats which is basically the predator so the basic behavior of rat is to go away from the predator right but when they are infected with this particular parasite they are attracted to a cat and finally they become prey to the cat so there are multiple ways these microbes can actually modulate our uh, behavior and mood and uh, change the conditions right so brain can directly influence the weight gain bowel movements nutrient delivery and microbial balance and gut bacteria can actually in other way can uh influence the neurotransmitters stress and anxiety mood and behavior so again you might have heard about uh, different neurotransmitters so serotonin is one of them right and it is uh, basically a, a a neurotransmitter which gives us happy feel right if more more than serotonin more the happy feel so usually when we see a good thing uh, when we get any achievement uh, when we see our dear ones uh, when we eat our favorite food the serotonin is secreted in large amount which gives us the happy feeling right but you know that 90% of the serotonin produced in our body is produced in the gut not in the brain only 10% of the serotonin is produced in the brain so there are many microbes which now we know can produce large amount of serotonin there are uh, microbes which can also produce other neurotransmitters like gaba dopamine and other things right so <clears throat> looking further in detail the brain to microbiota uh, communication happens through serotonin and dop- dopamine uh, there are neuromuscular control so we talk about uh, a movement of food so that is peristalsis then fight or flight or stress response okay which is usually given by something called as cortisol and the secretion of mucus so this is how brain controls the gut and uh, the bacteria in the gut can control the brain behavior by producing different metabolites so short chain fatty acids so usually people call them as scfas so they are produced exclusively by these bacteria and these short chain fatty acids they can directly talk with the brain and influence the activity in the brain so i'm going to talk about the short chain fatty acids later on in my presentation uh, they can also change the barrier or integrity of the uh, colon as well as intestine uh, by producing different molecules they can also influence the immune signaling uh, and they can also produce neuropeptides and neurotransmitters as i say and they can also cause the activation of vagus nerve now as i say these bacteria which are present in the gut uh because they can produce so many different metabolites they can also produce something which can activate the uh immune system of the individuals they can also produce some molecules which can increase the permeability of the gut thereby allowing some of these bacteria to penetrate and uh, enter the uh, blood 
right? And uh, by activating or by producing these gut peptides or neurotransmitters, it can also activate the vagus nerve, which in turn can talk with different parts of the brain like hippocampus and amygdala, right? And now people have, the researchers have found that uh, gut microbiome has a significant role to play in multiple neurodegenerative or neurological diseases like depression, anxiety, autism, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and many more. And uh, all these cardiovascular obesity, diabetes, they are all lifestyle associated diseases. So they are again, are some way or the other influenced by the gut microbiome. So again, the same part I'm trying to explain here. So there are different neurotransmitters which are produced by this bacteria, which are present in the lumen. Uh, they can produce this SCFAs. Uh, the tryptophan metabolism present uh, in this bacteria, they can again, it can directly influence the brain. Uh, there is a pathway called as kynurine pathway, which can again influence the brain directly. So similar study, which we saw for uh, obesity, people to check the effect of this gut microbiome, people have studied uh, uh, the anxiety and gut microbiome in two different mice. So these Balsi mice, which they were taken, uh, which were taken in the study, where they were genetically anxious, right? And the NI Swiss uh, mice taken in the study were healthy, normal uh, mice, uh, which had the habit of regular exploration and all. So they did this fecal transplant uh, of both these mice and they, ob they observed that NIH mice, when they were fed with the fecal microbiome of this uh, Balsi mice, they, they became more anxious. And the Balsi mice, they showed calming effect and actually then started exploring their environment. So such studies, uh, by using such studies, people have see, shown that it's not just genetic. Now, these, in, both these type of mice were genetically predisposed to a particular condition. But just by switching their microbiome, people have seen the completely reversed effects. So now talking about autism, again, autism is basically an impaired social interaction and communication, which is uh, restricted uh, I mean, it is. It shows the restricted uh, social interaction of these individuals, and it has restricted patterns of interest and repetitive behaviors usually seen in children. Right. So this particular behavior, for this, when people study the microbiome in healthy individuals and in the autistic children, they observe that in autistic children there is an increase in levels of two different types of bacteria, proteobacteria and bacteroides and there is a decreased level of firmicutes and actinobacteria. So when we talk about healthy individuals, we have highest levels of firmicutes, followed by bacteroides, followed by actinobacteria, and followed by proteobacteria. Now these proteobacteria, they are usually associated with the dysbiotic gut or problematic gut. And there are many bacteria which fall into this particular phylum, uh, uh, which are pathogenic. So, these bacteria, people have observed that there is an increase in these bacteria in autistic children. And these bacteria, then they have shown that they produce this toxic metabolites like phenols and precrisols and endols, uh, which in turn activates uh, the immune system and they have, uh, they produce pro-inflammatory cytokines, which in turn creates this irritable uh, behavior in autistic children, the anger and other things. So, <clears throat> Uh, some doctors uh, here in KEM, uh, they started using probiotics for this autistic children and they have actually observed a calming effect in this uh, uh, autistic children. And we are going to publish that work soon. So we are still working on it and we are finalizing this work. So there are clear cut observations that microbiome has a role to play in this condition. I'm not saying that microbiome is the only culprit here. So, but microbiome definitely has an influence on the final behavior. So this slide probably uh, I'll skip because uh, we know now that uh, in healthy CNS what happens, so there is a physiological clearance of protein from the brain, uh, physiological response to immune stimulation, physiological 
GABA signaling and healthy gut microbiota. And in the disease condition, we see dysbiotic microbiota. That means there is an altered uh, microbiome, different uh, composition of different bacteria. And these bacteria produce uh, many things like uh, mo um, um, molecules which can mimic our human uh, molecules. They can uh, have altered GABA signaling. They, have in, uh, they, they can cause increased gut permeability. And eventually, it can cause con cognitive dysfunction, uh, dementia, depression, and anxiety. Now, after just having an idea about how this microbiome behaves and uh, how it has a role to play in different disorders, it is also important to understand how we usually study these microbes, right? So, see, in humans carrying out uh, these studies in the gastrointestinal tract itself is very difficult because no healthy person will allow uh, any surgeon to insert uh, a needle and pinch their intestine or stomach and uh, study the microbiome over there, right? So fecal microbiome is currently the only option uh, which we are left with. And people have observed that the fecal sample uh, do contain the entire diversity which is present in the GI tract. So most of the studies that we carry out in healthy individuals uh, or the individuals uh, who do not have any gastrointestinal infection or disease, we use stool, stool samples for the study. But uh, in case of uh, GIT related diseases, uh, sometimes we are allowed to take biopsy samples. Now collecting biopsy samples, it requires special ethical clearances. Um, uh, it should be monitored uh, through a committee and if the committee allows, then only we are allowed to take the biopsy samples. So, as I said, all the studies in for um, gut uh, for uh, gut studies we use uh, stool samples, but uh, we do take oral samples, um, ocular that means eye samples, hair samples, skin samples, depending upon the type of disease or the conditions that we are studying. Now, to study these microbiome, what we usually do, uh, we extract the total amount of DNA which is present in the sample. Right, because uh, uh, being microbiologist or biotechnologist, you know now that uh, only 1% of the bacteria are culturable. 99% of the diversity is just not cultivable. So we are only left with the option of extracting the entire DNA. And once we extract the DNA, by using next generation sequencing technology, we sequence it. There are two different methods. I'll come to it. So we will sequence it and after sequencing it, we use computational tools and by using these computational tools, we identify the bacteria which are present over there. So we try to identify the entire diversity which is present and we also try to quantify the organisms. Like if there are 10 organisms, we try to quantify organism 1, the abundance of that organism, 2, 3, 4 and that way for all 10. And then we do the comparison between the samples, between the uh, study groups right so there are two ways of doing uh, for going about it so one is amplicon based approach and the second one is metagenomic approach okay now let's see uh, key, what is this amplicon based approach so as we say so when we take the stool sample we extract the genomic content uh, we extract the whole dna and this when we are using this marker gene based method we usually amplify for bacteria, we amplify 16S rRNA gene. So for amplifying this gene, we use universal 16S rRNA based primers and we get this gene from all the diversity of or all the genomic DNA that we have. And once we get that 16S rRNA gene, only that specific gene we sequence. Okay, so this is called as an amplicon based approach. And in the other approach, which is called as a whole metagenome or whole metatranscriptome approach, uh, we extract the entire DNA and we sequence everything which is present in the sample. Now, both approaches, they have their own advantages and disadvantages. So this amplicon based approach, because we are sequencing only a small, small part of the gene, a small part of the genome, we can capture the entire diversity. 
you remember i said that there is a huge diversity present in the gut in colon in small intestine and in the stomach so to capture that diversity we need to do lot of sequencing right so we need to have at least 10 trillion sequences if you want to understand each and every micro present over there but 10 trillion sequences is just impossible because of the limitations of the sequencing technology and the funding so instead of whole metagenome we go for 16s that is we sequence only this small piece of dna and by using some bioinformatic tools we cluster the sequences uh, into different groups so all sequences belonging to one particular bacterium or one particular taxa we group them the other we group the third and fourth and based on that we count the diversity so in this case we have four different types of bacteria and one organism is present in six number second in four third in three and fourth in one right so based on that we can identify the abundance as well as the diversity which is present over there and then we carry out lot of statistical analysis taxonomic assignments uh, we can also predict the functions based on the ta taxonomic classification so all these things we do in amplicon based approach we uh, another approach as i mentioned is whole metagenomic approach so in this case uh, we use the entire genomic content we chop it into small pieces and all these small pieces we sequence and after we sequence these pieces uh, we use uh, something called as uh, assembly which is again computational based approach and by using this assembly we try and construct all the genomes okay now uh, I just remind you here because we are using the whole genomic content in this entire process of whole metagenome we might also get a dna from humans from viruses from the food that we eat right so we have to remove all the contaminations and then finally use only sequences which are useful to us and then finally we can carry out similar analysis which we can carry out in uh, amplicon based approach so if we if you have any questions related to this you can ask me after the presentation okay so to understand the whole microbiome there are different approaches as we discussed so there is one approach of amplicon sequencing the other of whole metagenome sequencing but along with this bacteria also produce lot of metabolites to study these metabolites we again use different methods uh, like lcms ms gcms nmr and we call this as a metabolome of this organism so microbiome and metabolome together give us the holistic picture of what is happening in the gut and by using this information basically we can identify the correlation with the disease now for doing all these things we need to do a lot of sequencing as you can see because we are talking about millions and trillions of microbes which are Uh, residing in our gut so uh, i'll just quickly tell you about the sequencing technologies that we have so there are th now we have third generation sequencing technologies you must be uh, you must have heard about sanger sequencing this must be there in your syllabus so there are different methods of uh, classical sequencing right so sanger didioxy sequencing or maxim gilbert sequencing and this particular these are three different platforms this is uh, the latest one this is abi 3730 and uh, this is another previous platform which was applicable now these three platforms they uh, they produce long read lengths or long fragments where the dna sequence is determined okay so we can get a stretch of 1000 base pairs together uh, at the end of the sequencing reaction right now uh the the problem with this pro platform is that they cannot produce large amount of sequences um uh, in short duration and also the money involved in this sequencing is huge to give you an example when we started sequencing human genome we started this activity in 1990 and around 12 institutes all over the world were, were involved in sequencing one single human genome and it took them 12 years to complete one single human genome okay and for this they have used a platform called as abi 3730 machine okay which is a sanger based platform so you can imagine 12 institutes 12 years 
to complete one human genome and now with the advent of technology these new technologies um, this particular illumina platform it can give you one genome sequence in 3 days so you can imagine the amount of data this machines can generate as compared to the first generation platforms right so they generate a read lens they just generate very short reads but it is massively parallel sequencing so at the same time millions and millions of dna fragments are sequenced together so every base is determined at every single second and huge trillions uh, terabytes of data is generated okay and now in the third generation we have some new platforms emerging out uh, one is called as oxford nanopore and the other one is called as packbio now this oxford nanopore is a very small platform it is the size of your pen drive probably bigger than that maybe the size of your iphone or a tv remote and the packbio is a huge platform but uh, the advantage of oxford nanopore is that you can just carry your laptop uh carry basic things of dna extraction with you go for a sampling wherever you want like arctic antarctic extract the dna put it on the uh, flow cell or the machine and you can get the dna sequenced uh, in real time so this is the advantage of third uh, generation sequencing platforms and uh, these platforms as against the previous ones it can generate they can generate long reads very very long reads tens of kbs of long reads they can generate in a single go okay so just to give you an idea about the amount of data that they can generate so as you can see as i said so all these hisic hisic x hisic 2500 nexi these are all illumina platforms okay so you can see on this axis the read length of these platforms and here on this axis you can see the amount of data generated per run so currently we have a platform this uh, which is the latest one from illumina so it lies somewhere here it is called as noa c and it generates 6000 tb of data i am talking about 6000 tb that means 50 human genomes in one run in two days you can sequence and in just one lab these platforms again can easily sequence one or two or even tens of genomes uh, uh in one go and uh, these platforms they do not produce huge amount of data but they give you really really long reads and you can see the sample sequencing here uh, so it can generate less amount of reads uh, as compared to what we can get from the second and third generation platforms right so this is about uh, what these platforms can produce and how we generally study this microbar now coming back to the gut brain axis i have one example of how actually uh, our brain is modulated by the gut bacteria and how brain actually also in turn affects the bacteria which are present in the gut so this study we conducted uh, uh, in 2018 and 19 in that particular uh, period and uh, i'll just give a brief you about what we did so this is about the mild traumatic brain injury okay so the mice uh, or not actually mice we studied rats over here so these rats were given a small traumatic brain injury so they were hit on the brain in a particular way by using a particular paradigm uh, so a rat holding box and everything which is standard and which is used uh, all the time by different uh, researchers so this this technology or the method is standard okay so <clears throat> we use this particular paradigm and uh, based on this paradigm uh, we studied the microbiome at different stages okay so i'll come to this later uh, quickly i'll tell you about uh, how we decided or how we thought that we should uh, see the effect of mtbr on the microbiome so the previous study uh, study is carried out my collaborator uh, amul sakharkar he found that uh, uh, after we induce a traumatic injury there is a change in dna methylation uh, which regulates the neuropeptide y expression in rat tissue okay so they observed already that traumatic injury uh, induces changes in the dna methylation pattern in the brain 
and this changes in the dna methylation pattern in turn affects the expression of a, a protein called as bdna which is brain derived neurotrophic factor okay so we already knew that mtbi or mild traumatic brain injury it affects the gut motility uh, gut motility it also affects the anxiety like behavior and it can cause epigenetic changes or modifications in the brain so we thought of studying gut microbiome to see whether the microbes also have a role to play in all these things so <clears throat> the first objective of our study was to understand the effect of mild traumatic uh, brain injury on microbial communities of rat jejunum why jejunum because jejunum directly interacts uh, with the brain with the amygdala and it is known uh, based on the previous previous literature the experiments uh, that we carried uh, the experiment that we carried out was 16s rrna amplicon sequencing to characterize gut microbial communities of the jejunum okay so what we did was we selected 60 day adult rats and uh, on alternate days till day 70 we gave them five mtbs five mild traumatic brain injuries and then we collected uh, their uh, we sacrifice uh, these rats and we collected their brain intestine uh, and uh, we observed it after 6 hours we observed it after 48 hours and we also observed it after 30 days uh, so for microbiome we took mucosal scraping from the jejunum and we stored it at uh, minus 80 degrees celsius then we isolated the dna and uh, uh, from the scraping okay and then we used standard pipeline or analysis method for uh, studying the microbiome uh, so what we observed uh, is that uh, so first let me explain you what this graph is so here on the left hand side if we see this observed graph so here we have uh, colored the mice uh, based on the treatment right so 30 days uh, mtbi 48 hours 6 hours and control rats and alpha diversity on this axis we have the bacterial diversity okay so the different type of bacteria observed in these organisms so if we see the controlled rats where the mtbi was not given at all both the rats they had higher amount of bacterial diversity clearly you can see these two purple dots here after 6 hours we could see that the diversity reduced drastically so from 800 the diversity went down to around 500 to 300 and after 48 hours it still persisted but after 30 days it even reduced down and it came down to around 300 to 350 okay so these are a different uh, statistical parameters will not go into the details of what is chao one and what is shannon but on this right hand axis we have something called as pcoa plot okay now in this pcoa plot this one single dot which you can see here gray color dot the position of this dot in this plot is determined by the diversity that means the type of bacteria which are present and also by their abundances that means the level of the bacteria which are present okay so closer the dot means their diversity is more or less similar and distant the dot is that means their diversity is quite different than each other so you can see these uh, circles clearly that the control rats gray in color they have a completely different type of diversity and composition of this bacteria and the rats which were given this traumatic brain injury they had a completely different microbiome now this is really fascinating and interesting just by giving one physical blow small blow on their head the entire microbiome diversity is changing that means there is a direct connection between the brain and the gut the brain is talking with the gut and it is changing the diversity so sometimes you might have observed people that when they are very they are very scared uh, they either go for uh, uh, they usually uh, have vomiting kind of feeling or uh, other stomach related feelings right so these things are also very common in rats <clears throat> so now uh, here i'm sorry for this the 
figure behind is not visible but what we want to show here is the phylum level diversity so actinobacteria you can see that the colors over here they are uh, by using these legends so you can see that in control rats there is high amount of a uh, less amount of proteobacteria and high amount of firmicutes right and also we can see the presence of bacteroides but when we see 6 hours 48 hours and 30 days bacteria we can see that high levels of proteobacteria in all these bacteria and reduction in the diversity of firmicutes right so in one of my previous slide i told you that proteobacterial increase is always correlated with the disease or dysbiotic condition <clears throat> okay so at genus level this uh, that classification was at the phylum level when we see at the genus level we can see that the most abundant genera in mtbi exposed animals were helicobacter mm -hmm. followed by campylobacteria bacter while in control the most abundant genus was lactobacillus so we can clearly see the differences in the bacteria which are present in control and uh, mtbi given mice uh, rats um out of whatever uh, whatever uh, based on the taxonomy that we got uh, we tried to classify or get only those organisms which can produce this scfas or the butyrates and we found that the butyrate producing bacteria short chain fatty acid producing bacteria were in high amount in controlled rats as compared to mtbi given rats okay so again this observation supports that butyrate has some role to play in this okay so so far what we observed is that there is a decrease in alpha diversity that means there is a clear cut decrease in the diversity of bacteria after trauma the bacterial population shifts immediately post trauma so just after within 6 hour the population changes and shift persist till 30 days uh, then there are two type of genera which we found increased in the traumatic patients and we also uh, found that butyrate producing families were depleted in the trauma samples now based on this findings uh, we searched through the literature and we that time we found that butyrate has a role to play in uh, the brain activity so <clears throat> butyrate in the brain it can actually pass this uh, 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 gut barrier and enter the blood stream and this butyrate in turn can inhibit the hdac so hdac is basically the histone deacetylase uh, enzyme okay uh, this histone deacetylase en enzyme increases histone acetylase uh, acetylation okay so when the histone is acetylated it actually opens up the chromatin and which is a mark of transcription okay so butyrate inhibits hdac which opens up the chromatin and allows the transcription now because of this we saw that there is an increased synthesis of this neurotropic factor called as bdna okay which is which reduces the anxiety so all these things were known so based on our experiments uh, we <coughs> removed the brain uh, actually the amygdala from the brain of these rats <coughs> and we observed that the control rats had lowest levels of hdac2 so we carried out this real time pcr uh, for the hdac gene from the brain and by looking at the expression of this hdac uh, uh, hdac2 in uh, control and other rats we observed that there is a higher uh, production of hdacs in the traumatic rats <coughs> to check whether microbiome only has a role to play in this we carried out other experiment where we actually <coughs> co-housed these rats after 30 days for one week we co-housed these rats with uh, other healthy rats now these rats have a habit of coprophagy that means they can eat uh, each other's fecal material and we also carried out fmt fmt is basically a fecal microbiota a transplant so we fed the other rats with the fecal pellets of the uh, healthy rats and what we observed was that in this fmt and co-housing again the hdac levels reduced down drastically so after 30 days when we co-house them or when we did fmt the hdac expression levels were 
very close or equal to the control rats so that means microbes are playing a significant role in uh, anxiety and uh, in the expression of bdnf so this is all basically i have so as we can see that these microbes uh, they have important role to play in different disease conditions they have a huge role to play in uh, uh, neurodegenerative and neurological disorders uh, we have just now started exploring the role of these microbes and i'm sure that in future there will be uh, this will be used as a exceptionally powerful tool for personalized therapies uh, when we can use it in conjunction of human genome or other treatments so currently i'm sure that later on you'll be asking me questions about how then we can modulate the gut microbiome how can we can change how we can fix it so <clears throat> we do not have a single solution for all the problems in the human microbiome initiative or the indian human microbiome studies we have found that uh, the microbial content of all the individuals living in different geographical locations uh, belonging to different ethnicity it is completely different because the lifestyle that people follow in different parts of the country they are completely different the genetic makeup is different some people are strictly non vegetarian some people are strictly vegetarian the way they cook food is different some people eat high fiber diet some people have high carbohydrate content some people have high fat content so all these things have a direct influence of micro uh, on the microbiome and in turn microbiome has a effect on who we are or about on our on our overall health right so <clears throat> there are different ways uh, by which we can change the microbiome but we do not have one single solution for every disease or for every individual so <clears throat> the probiotics all of you must have heard these are good bacteria uh, which are usually available in the market uh, they are commercially available so uh, these uh, bacteria are uh, usually used for general health but now with uh, the advances in the microbiome study we also know that there are next generation probiotics or what we also call them as precision probiotics that means these particular probiotics they can be used for a particular disease condition okay and this next generation probiotics can have genetically modified organisms for example if you identify that there is a lack of one particular strain of organism in the gut we can introduce more important gene in that particular organism and feed to the individual there are live biotherapeutic products also available which can be used then of course there is a raw crude method uh, which is fecal microbial transplant but sometimes we this is the only solution that we get uh, to treat uh, the chronic disorders for example uh, uh, clostridium difficile disorder uh, which is caused by uh, c difficile disorder which is caused by clostridium difficile so in that case people have observed that fecal microbial transplant is the only solution that we have as of now uh, then instead of using the whole fecal microbiome as a for transplantation we can actually recover some of the organisms and use this microbial consortia and give it as a solution then uh, people are also using postbiotics so postbiotics are basically uh, killed or heat killed or dead uh, probiotic organisms and they are fed to the uh, individuals and they also people have observed that these organisms can also um, activate the immune response they can also Uh, give some important metabolites to the individual and they can be helpful the other approach is the prebiotic approach where instead of giving live organisms or dead organisms we use uh, food which uh, helps the good bacteria to grow okay so for example uh, some specific oligosaccharides uh, fermentable fibers uh, polyphenols fatty acids non carbohydrate substrates and fiber uh, and vitamins so these can be used to uh, specifically enhance or grow specific group of bacteria 
and in between lies symbiotics. So that means it is a combination of both probiotic as well as prebiotic. And fermented food, all as you know, that it also has some good part from the prebiotic. It also has some live organisms and dead organisms, and also sometimes microbial consortia. So when we say fermented food, it is all the pickles, curd, many other things that we eat, right? So these are different ways uh, microbiome can be modulated. Modulating genes or the genetic make makeup of individual is very, very, very difficult. But as compared to that, microbiome therapies are very easy to carry out. And that's why people all over the world are focusing on this science. So thank you. Thanks a lot for your time. And I'm open for questions. Thank you, sir. I request the participants to please post their questions in the chat box. So till they start posting questions, sir, I have a question. Sir, how do they, how does this gut microbiome thing? Is there any immune tolerance that they exhibit? Uh, tolerance mechanisms? Immune tolerance? Uh, yes, of course, there are, because these organisms, they have evolved with us for years. I mean, for generations, basically. So our body also knows some of the good bacteria and uh, uh, it treats these bacteria in a particular way. And uh, the bacteria also have the mechanism to evade our immune response. So as long as they are in the gut, uh, our body doesn't mind it. But when they enter our bloodstream or the actual, uh, 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 basically the bloodstream, the body starts reacting to it. I request Rashmi to please continue with the question answer session. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the first question is, sir, is there any method by which one can identify the type of microbiome anyone possesses? Uh, yes, I explained to you that there are different ways. One is basically you culture whatever organisms which are there by using simple microbiology technique. But uh, this method is uh, not sufficient as we cannot grow all the organisms in the lab. So the other method remain, uh, which remains is uh, we extract the DNA uh, from any sample, from your skin, from your oral cavity, from your gut, whatever. Extract the DNA uh, and do uh, DNA sequencing. And once we do DNA sequencing, we can, by using bioinformatic tools, uh, we can identify these organisms. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, Is there, as we all know about E. coli being an opportunistic organism, are there some other organisms also in this group? Yes, there are plenty. As we discussed, there are approximately minimum 1,000 to 10,000 species present in the gut. And there are many which are opportunistic pathogens. So in uh, one of my slides, I showed that uh, Compilobacter and Helicobacter they are more abundant after the traumatic brain injury. But now here when I'm saying, talking about helicobacter, it is not helicobacter pyroli, which causes uh, gastric ulcers. So it is a genus heli helicobacter pyroli. So we don't know exactly which species it belongs to. So such organisms are always present in the gut. But they are uh, in their uh, stable form. They are not uh, pathogenic to us. But when there is a disturbance, some of them might turn pathogen. Okay, okay sir. Thank you. As per uh, the next question is, as per your view, is the is change in the microbiome a cause or a consequence? Uh, see, uh, it is uh, very difficult to say. Uh, now, if we take an example of uh, traumatic brain injury again, it is a consequence right because of that physical injury we see that there is a change in the microbiome 
okay and there is a way by which we can restore it so that we can reduce the anxious behavior which we observe after the uh, 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 mtba okay but in some cases microbiome is uh, people have found that it is a causative agent right so for example if we take the uh, newborn infants if the microbiome which is harbored by these babies if it is not in good shape if it is not healthy then it uh, can cause lot of diseases uh, later in their life so it depends on what we are looking for sometimes it is causative sometimes it is a consequence the next question what's the role of microbiome in cancers yes uh, cancer peep there are multiple ways uh, see people have also observed that the drugs that we uh, take orally and the availability bioavailability uh, bioavailability of these drugs also depend on the microbes which are present in your gut uh, the chemotherapy the response to the chemotherapy is again dependent on the microbes which are present so in multiple ways these microbes uh, have a role in cancer so you can read out papers on chemotherapy and microbiome uh, people have found direct evidence of few organisms in colorectal cancer that means the cancer of the colon so people have observed that there is a high increase of fusobacteria in the patients uh, with uh, colon uh, cancer so such way people have found associations and people are also targeting these organisms so if we can reduce these organisms uh, and find out whether uh, we can reduce the risk of uh, these uh, uh, diseases people are also using them uh, as a tool uh, for identifying whether the individual is predisposed to a particular disease so there are companies now established who can uh, determine your microbiome and can tell you whether you have a risk of particular disease later in your life the next question says can microbiome help us find defined media for fastidious organisms defined media for fastidious uh, organisms yes it is possible but uh, we have to do ultra deep sequencing so that we can construct all the genome of the bacteria present in the gut so once we construct the entire genome we know the metabolic pathways which are present in these organisms right and once we know the metabolic pathways we know uh, what are the substrate these organisms can live on what are the conditions uh, these organisms require so people have done such reverse engineering to grow uncultured bacteria from the uh, with the help of metagenomic data uh -huh. <clears throat> the next question says that uh, sir i have heard of gut hypnotherapy in relation to this topic can you throw more light on to this gut hypnotherapy yes sir you mean to say hypnotism i did not get the word gut hypnotherapy <clears throat> yes the hypnotism um no unfortunately you must you might have heard but i have not heard about it and as i said i mean now this science is growing exponentially it is just impossible to keep track of what is happening in the field right now so maybe there is a possibility because hypnosis again is related to brain so microbiome might have some role to play over there the next question is that can you suggest some food that can improve the serotonin level which can improve the serotonin level uh you are on mute oh sorry yeah so serotonin level okay i i mean it is uh, better that we currently stick to the best food practices that we know uh, that means eating healthy food eating fiber rich food uh, eating less fatty food junk food related things 
I will not recommend anybody to go now into the medical store and buy hundreds of probiotics and start eating them without knowing what they are. So, uh, my suggestion right now will restrict to this only. But uh, yes, there are organisms which people have found uh, which can produce large amount of serotonin, uh, but they are uh, not uh, still validated. Uh, we don't know whether these organisms can also cause some other issues, right? So, an uh, organism might have uh, uh, a machinery to produce high levels of serotonin, but the organism might also have other factors uh, like toxin producing, some other virulence factors. So, such things we don't know and research is going on in the field. So, the best practice right now is to eat healthy and uh, only go for probiotic if they are recommended by the doctors or go for general probiotics like Yakult or whatever. Best is to have curd in your diet daily. Rashmi, one last question. We can do. Yes. Uh... Also, one last question. When patients are on some aggressive antimicrobial treatment, do they suffer from depression because maybe the gut microbiome is affected due to it? Yes, of course. The aggressive behavior, again, is uh, some way or the other related with uh, our HPA axis that we call as hippocampus pituitary and adrenal axis. Okay? And as we discussed, the calming effect that we see in the uh, in our behavior is in a way controlled by the neurotransmitters that we produce uh, the uh, acid the epigenetics and the production of uh, different brain derived neurotrophic factors so these factors they are controlled by multiple ways microbes can also control these factors so these aggressive behaviors uh, can be uh, controlled by uh, using uh, probiotic organisms or uh, by using microbes. Thank you so much, sir. Over to you, Amina. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I can see the chat box is full of questions. The whole session was so entertaining that it has, actually, it has solved many of our doubts, but at the same time, we have many questions popping in our mind. Thank you, sir. Now, now I request Ms. Amina Dulkawala to propose a formal vote of thanks. Also, I request the participants to please fill the feedback form. The feedback link has been posted in the chat box. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, a silent gratitude isn't of much use to anyone. So on behalf of the departments of biotechnology and microbiology, KC College, HSNC University, it gives me a great pleasure to extend our gratitude. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank our speaker for the day, Dr. Dhiraj Dhotre. Uh, there is a very old saying which goes that a way to a man's heart is through the stomach. I think I can modify that saying a little bit today and uh, because of Sir's lecture and I can say that a way to a men's health is to the gut and the stomach as well. So thank you so much sir, for such an informative question. As already ma'am stated that uh, it has left answers our queries and raised more questions as well. Um, uh, I would also like to thank Dr. Rita Mukhopadhyay, the president of IWSA, and Dr. Susan Epin, the past president of uh, IWSA. Uh, for allow uh, for giving us this opportunity to host the popular science lecture it has always been a pleasure and it has been one today as well um, uh, my gratitude also goes to our dearest principal dr himlata k bagla uh, there is a quote which goes leadership is the cap uh, capability uh, capacity to translate vision into reality uh, ma'am is a leader who has always led us in this direction and all our programs uh, are a result of that vision that ma'am has um, uh, I would also like to thank the entire team of Department of Biotechnology and Microbiology. Uh, the, my vote of thanks would be incomplete without thanking all the participants, the audience. Uh, as again, I'm uh, adding one more quote here. You have to respect your audience. Without them, you are essentially standing alone singing to yourself. So uh, it is very important to have a good audience uh, there to listen to what you are trying to say. 
So my deepest gratitude to them and to all the participants who were there today. And last but not the least, a very big thank you to the tech support led by Dr. Roshan Kalani and Monish, who has been the tech in charge for today. Thank you, everyone.